Welcome back to our wetlands part two, swamps, marshes, and bogs. In this lecture, we're going to cover each of these individually and learn about the animals, plants, and other things that make each of these wetlands unique. Swamps are probably one of the most common wetlands that we have in the state of Pennsylvania. And they're gonna be the ones that are generally denoted by the fact that there are trees. If you look at the photograph over here on the left, please note that there's no water in this picture at this current time. That doesn't make this not a wetland. Remember, water can sometimes be above ground in the water table, or sometimes it can be just below ground. A lot of times in Pennsylvania, you'll know that you're walking through a swamp because as you tread across the land, it feels a little bit spongy. That means that just below the surface, there is water, and that when it rains or runs off from a nearby area, that water table will come up above, and you'll be able to see the water. Sometimes this water can be called potholes in a marsh. Sometimes they can be called vernal pools in a swamp. It really just depends on what area and what wetland you're in, um, what the actual name of the water once it comes up above the land is but it's a swamp year round, water or not. Swamps can also have two types of trees. They can have both deciduous, um, such as willows and aspens and maples, but they can also have conifers, pines, hemlocks, and others. This is a particular type of tree swamp. This is called a mangrove or a cypress swamp. The photograph that you're looking that at on the left was taken in 10,000 Islands, or I guess the 10,000 Islands section of Everglades National Park. And if you look right here, you can see a beautiful osprey. The reason I love this photograph and included it is because it gives you an idea about how these mangrove trees are literally holding the land together. So this is an island maybe an acre, an acre and a half in size. And look at how these roots are extended out. You can see that the water has eroded this away. Now, this is tidal water. So every single day, this water is going left to right when the tide comes in and right to left as the tide goes out. And it's scraping and wearing away at this island. And were it not for these swamp trees, then this little island piece would disappear. And there are a whole lot of things that live on these islands. You might think, oh, on a, such a small island, what could live there? But things like raccoons and possums will actually swim from the mainland and make their home on these um, seafood-rich islands. This is Congaree National Park. And as you can see, I'm standing on a boardwalk. This is a bald cypress swamp. These are bald cypress trees. And in a later photograph, I'll actually show you one of the features that they have. They have these knees that come up out of the water. Scientists are not 100% sure what their use is. Some say stabilization. Some say that it helps the tree to be able to exchange gases, but no one's sure. But what you can see is, again, swamps have many trees as one of the dominant species. Here's a larger photograph, same Congaree National Park. You can see again on the shore, we do get a little bit more diversity, some understory, but the water portion have trees that live in it all the time. So these trees are highly adapted to be able to be in saturated conditions. More swamps. Um, obviously, this is an aerial photograph of a swamp. Now, that entire thing is a lake. But because I've been to no, Rocky Mountain National Park and took this photograph, I know that all along the edge that I'm pointing at right now are swamps. And they go right into a coniferous forest. Over here is a strangler fig. This is a swamp in Florida. And you can see how it's using these large roots to be able to stabilize itself. Again, no water in this photograph, but this entire area floods several times a year, meaning that this beautiful tree, which has been there for several hundred years, needs to be able to stabilize itself during those wet periods. Leon Sinks National uh, Geologic Area. This one here. And then again, over here. I wanted to show you some of the understory of a swampy region. Look at the ferns, 
look at the oxialis. And what I'm holding here are actually called salmon berries. And instead of having raspberries or blackberries in the Pacific Northwest, they have these things called salmon berries. So in our swamps, you would be more familiar with raspberries and blackberries. If you went to the Pacific uh, Northwest, then you would be familiar with these, which are salmon berries. Swamps all over the nation have very similar characteristics. It's just the exact tree species or the exact understory species that does change. Here are some animals that live in swamps. Over here we have the beautiful red fox. We have the American rabbit. Here we have a golden finch and over here the American toad. Marshes. Marshes can be two type. Both salt water slash saline water and fresh water. This is in New England and I happen to know that this is a saline swamp. If this photograph went out onto the side here, you'd actually be able to see the Atlantic Ocean. Swamps tend to form in certain types of areas. Often they form at the mouths of rivers. We'll see some of those later. They all form in areas where there's poor drainage and they have the most nutrient rich soil of any of the three types of wetlands. Here you can see a duck and her baby ducks and when you look at this hopefully you can immediately tell the dominant species in a marsh. Look at all the grasses that are found here. Please don't focus on the background. This is the actual marsh portion, and then this goes into actually a sand dune environment. Here are some close ups of different marsh plants. This is called a sedge. Please look at the triangular nature. Hopefully, you know the cattails. Look at their grass. And then over here um, are grass species. Here are two types of marshes. This one is from South Carolina. This is a tidal marsh. When the tide is out, this is a literal mud flat. Right now the tide is in and you can see the egrets hanging out in the branches on the edge of the marsh and you can see the marsh grass here. This is in Alabama. This is a non-tidal marsh. This water is here seasonally. I happen to be there in the spring and so you can see how there's water and you can see all the water birds that are here. You can also see some mangrove trees that are right here. Lots of animals like to live in marshes. The beaver, the possum, the American toad, and of course our friend the pelican, along with a whole lot of other species. Invertebrates. Invertebrates love pretty much all marshes, but they are especially prevalent um, in this particular type of wetland. Lots of moth species, lots of insect species. Because they are tidal and non-tidal, you get a lot of shellfish. And there's my friend, the fishing spider, just waiting for a small minnow to come along so he can get it. In wetlands of all types, marshes, swamps, bogs, you're gonna see a lot of decomposers hanging out. And so this one is in the marsh section because I found it in a marsh. You can see the mushroom, the lichen, and over here you can see uh, another decomposer on the ground. Slug, fungus, and some really beautiful fruiting bodies of both the mosses and the lichens. Last one bogs, probably my favorite as well. They have very acidic soil and very, very low water movement, low O2. When you look at this picture here, this is an extremely up close picture. Even the things that look tall are really only below the knee. So I am kneeling on the ground, taking this photograph over a long area. So even though these plants here look very tall, they're actually very, very short. Here's an example of how sometimes the land can look like there's no water whatsoever, but when a sinkhole forms, you can see that just below the surface, all of this groundwater is hanging out.
Here is a 360 degree view of an alpine bog. Bogs form at all kinds of levels. This one, it is at 12,000 feet. I, basically, I walked in and the boardwalk takes you across the actual bog. Bogs are amazing at preserving things. In Scotland and other places, when people would fall or be buried in the bogs, their bodies would become mummified, almost like the people in Egypt. And this is due to the fact that there is so little O2 that there's barely even any bacteria inside the bogs. Fingernails and hair are fully preserved in the bog people. Sphagnums. These are little tiny low growing plants that do not require a tremendous amount of nutrients. There are things that grow in bogs that are actually commercial plants. So we do grow cranberries and blueberries here. Some plants get so desperate that they actually become carnivorous. Here is a pitcher plant and a sundew right here. Both of these supplement their nutrients by eating other animals. Cranberry bog, right before harvest time. Also, lots of vertebrates and invertebrates like to come here to live and breed. Now, there's not a tremendous amount of food for these guys, but that means that there's not a lot of predators either. So my, my bullfrog here is happy to lay his eggs in this particular bog. And my snake is passing through, potentially to lay a clutch of eggs, or potentially trying to find someone like my frog who's going to lay the eggs and then go back to somewhere where there's more food, maybe the snake gets to catch it on its way in and out. That's the end. So again, swamps, bogs, marshes, hopefully now you're a little bit better educated on those.